The following podcast is brought to you exclusively by the Arad Rob Radio Network. Sorts. How many of those big balls do you get for turn? You get two if you get a spare and one if you get a strike. Number one, if you bowl 801 in three games, what's your average game? What is your average? 267. Will the real Tommy Petraglia please stand go. up? Down. We got it. Ah. <laughs> But the backstory of the 300 is uh, really uh, special. Welcome to Straight Up Five with Johnny Petraglia Jr. This podcast is hard hitting, in depth, cutting edge look into the sport of bowling. You will get unfettered access into the mind of one of the most gifted bowlers of this generation who just happens to be the son of a living legend. So, without further ado, let's introduce you to the host of the show, Brad Rob, Rob Francois, Dr. Ocho, and the incomparable Johnny Petraglia Jr. Hey guys, welcome back to Straight Up 5. This is episode number 10. I am your host, Rad Rob, Rob Francois. I hope everybody's doing well all around the world, and thank you for being here. We have a very, very special guest on this week. Uh, it's something I've been looking forward to for a long time. It's kind of a bucket list thing, being a bowler for the last 40 years. Uh, I'm, Rob, really I'm here every week. What oh, are you John, talking about? You know, you're very excited. <laughs> every week I'm here. So last week... You got pissed off because I didn't intro you. And so now you're just going to hijack my opening. That's great. No, that's awesome. Go ahead, buddy. Well, you've heard it. Uh, Dr. Ocho's here. Tell everybody how you're doing, Ocho. I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad I made your night, honestly. Like, I, I know I make your night when we do the other show and this show, but I, I, it's about time I heard it just because of how much I mean to you in this community. Woo! Right on, brother. Uh, we also have the other host of the show, the sexiest man alive. The, the, the most jacked guy in, in the sport of bowling. Well, look at that smile. God, look at that smile. He's such a good-looking guy. Johnny Sr. Just, he's he's know, blushing. Yeah, he is. Yeah. Uh, it's Johnny Petraglia Jr., JP Jr. Good to see you, buddy. Always a pleasure to see you, Rad Rob. And my life coach, as always, Dr. Ocho. And accompanied by uh, our very, very special guest today, uh, are, are, am I am I leading with this one? I'm going to. You can. I mean, go go for it. It's your show. I, I'd rather hear. I'd rather hear your. Call him by the right name. <laughs> introducing That's our right. introducing our special guest, hailing from New Jersey. He is a PBA Hall of Famer. He threw the sixth three hundred game uh, seventh 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 three hundred game in PBA history on ABC. He is a living legend. He is the Godfather. Father of the sexiest man alive. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Johnny Petraglia Sr., JP Sr., it is so good to have you here. I've been looking forward to talking to you for quite a while. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Rob. It's my pleasure to be here. You're looking good. You're looking trim. Uh, you know, what are you, do, what are you right. doing nowadays to keep yourself uh, in shape? Uh, I'm still working for Brunswick, and I'm uh, bowling a lot and playing golf a lot. And so... Uh, the three put together keeps me pretty busy. I got a busy schedule coming up starting tomorrow. I'll be on the road a lot starting tomorrow for about the next 10 or 11 days. So. Wow. Still going strong. I'm telling you, Junior, I hope you got that that longevity there, brother. Uh, so do I, Rob. I, I tell you the <laughs> truth. I don't know how. I think about how my body feels after I drive for three hours somewhere. Right. I couldn't imagine driving for four days and then bowling 40 games yeah. when I'm 70. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Junior told us you bowled very well uh, in your last outing in a tournament, uh, almost making uh, the finals. Uh, congratulations uh, I on that. Uh, I, uh, I, you know, only uh, only two lefties made the top 32 in Jackson, Michigan. I was one of the two, and uh, I was actually high lefty in the tournament. And so it was, it was a good week. And it's nice to book, get out there, bowl a tournament, and then to have a good week on top of it. That was that was fun. Now, uh, Junior said that he's trying to get you back into throwing urethane, something you did, you know, probably 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. You said you're a little bit hesitant in getting uh, back into the, uh, the I, urethane. I am, I, I, uh, but I threw nothing but urethane in Jackson, Michigan. I had two uh, urethane bowling balls, and 
And those are the only two balls I used all week. So uh, when when it applies, the, the balls work <laughs> fine. I just I've been a little resistant, and uh, but you know I'm coming around. And they both worked better than anything else I had that week. And and obviously uh, whatever the other lefties were throwing. So it was the right equipment at the right time. That's almost the old tournament feel too, right? You know, walking yeah. in with only two balls instead of like seventeen, like some of these guys have. You know, yeah. you you it's the stuff you used to talk about when I was teaching you about bowling years ago. Uh, that you you know only have the two, you know, one or two balls drilled up. You'd have to change your hand position instead, and you know, make the ball do some of the work. That let the athlete show its skill rather than the ball doing everything. So it's good. And a matter of fact, that's why you always did good in those plastic ball tournaments. Now that I think about it. Yeah, I did. I did well in the plastic ball tournaments because uh, uh, still old school. The first move is not to change bowling balls for me. It, it uh, I know it should be the way it is for all the young guys today, but I that's sort of like the third move. You know, the first one is uh, yeah. hand position and lane position. Uh, you know, the first couple of moves. You know, and then. Uh, and then when all else fails, uh, then I go to changing bowling balls. Where uh, if you're growing up in today's environment, you the first move is is to change a bowling ball. That's very hard for me to to do. I uh, I, I, uh, I can do a better job changing myself physically before before I uh, switch bowling balls. And that's Damn, what I already got the chills. Holy shit! Uh, well, I mean that's well, what we were talking about last week, right? Like Ocho's first move. When he threw, you know, two flat shots, it's to change his ball and just that's used. It was one time. Don't I know how to teach? I know how to coach. Yeah. That was just a one time incident. I'm better now. Oh well, can I say uh, something about Doctor Ocho here? Sure, go ahead. By all means, tell, I'm, I'm watching I'm, you, should, you need Dr. to let the people Ocho know in the how league. important I was. Yeah, we're bowling in the league, and you know he just kept throwing every ball through the nose. So I told him to move four and two left. And he said, four and two what? <laughs> I, said, I said, that means six. What does that even mean? <laughs> yeah. It, it, uh, having to explain that we were discussing boards on the lane. Uh, we had to, we had to start from scratch. So, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I, I guess he's made great, great progress since then. Yes. <laughs> he, he, yeah, it, he was, has. it was it was knowledge uh, that I love to hear about. That's when I first learned of what was called a break point, and I thought it was something on my car. Again, <laughs> and I, I'm a life coach. I'm not just a bowling coach here. So <laughs> it was uh, it was it was very informative. I have yet to apply it, but I'm still now at least understanding what the uh, mechanics were. <laughs> uh, I want to be sick. I it want to elaborate shows how much your natural ability is there. Well, that's true. No, that is it's, true. Look, it's what can Ocho do? I'm trying. Yeah. Junior, you're going to say something. Yeah, I wanted to elaborate on, on dad with the urethane because an, another thing that, that goes unnoticed about when my dad bowls is like dad always bowls well. Like when the lefties bowl well, dad always bowls well. But when the lefties don't bowl well, Okay, fine. There's there's going to be times that the lefties just don't bowl well. Period. But there are always the, it. It always seems like when my dad bowls and he is striking when the other lefties aren't, he strikes a lot more. Like I've watched him lead tournaments playing an arrow that most lefties don't know how to play. Right. By hundreds and hundreds of pins, and like when he says to me that he was one of the only two cashing lefties in that event throwing urethane, that also tells me that resin was probably not the play that week. And a lot of other guys tried to do it. So I always feel like that's always been one of his tricks is that because he's comfortable and he's consistent and he knows how to repeat, especially when he's in a groove and likes to do things that are outside the normal elements and realm of a left-handed bowler to begin with. I think it's one of the reasons why urethane worked that week is because I think you also maybe recognize that nothing was working for anybody else. So like what harm could it do to try this? That's, and, uh, that's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in a normal yeah. sense, he'd, he'd jump way, way right and, and, and flip it wide, which the other lefties couldn't do. And that would work at those other times when no lefty could do anything. And then you find the time when you're, what's the word, walled out? I'm learning this mm -hmm. stuff too here, guys. Uh, well, so, I've always been more comfortable playing inside than outside. I had to learn how to bowl outside. I'm comfortable playing in. So uh, one of the things that happens is when – 
I can't really find anything. My first move is always moving in, not moving out, because uh, I have much more confidence when I move in. I, I've done uh, done my best bowling from in. At one time, I had uh, seven senior records on tour, and, and none of them were outside of 15. They were all 15 or deeper, because that's my favorite place on the lane to be. But uh, being left-handed, you don't get too many chances to play in there. Because Dad, you, you have to cross the track, and that creates problems. Yeah. Dad, cross the track. Me, oh, I'm sorry, JP Jr. Give me, cross the track. So we, uh, break that down just for some amateurs here. So okay. So so 90 percent of the field is right-handed, and the mm -hmm. and the track is usually between uh, you know 10 and 15, and uh, maybe a little bit deeper. And so when when the right-handers are moving in, they're they're catching the track uh, oh, further down the, the lane. And put in for putting the oil downwards, I guess. It, right? It's uh, it actually becomes a little bit of a, almost a little bit of a hollow in the old days, I guess you could say. Uh, but, but what would happen is that if, if you're right-handed and, and you're starting to go high, you keep moving left, you keep moving in to catch a track later and later and later. Uh, and, and it'll always work for you on. So now when you're left-handed and you're way in, you're going to have to cross over that track and, and there's nothing to throw it to. You're not, so you're, it, you're it not trying to catch a track is, further down. You're trying to just find a place to play. So uh, it, uh, it, it makes it different, uh, on, on the left side playing in the, uh, the left side of the lane is always more pristine than the right side. So, um, uh, you know, lefties um, uh, don't have trouble getting the ball through the heads most of the time. And, uh, and you can, and, and when you're moving way in, a lot of times uh, the ball still wants to hook early. If, but, but if you can get that ball down lane, uh, it just, for me, it seems easier the way that I was taught that the pocket's right in front of me. I'm looking at it. You know, 15, 20, uh, if I'm playing that deep, it, it, it feels very, very comfortable. When I'm out around three, four, five, uh, the pockets to my right, my spots to the left, it just doesn't coordinate correctly. <laughs> I just don't feel comfortable out there yeah, well, the way that I do when I'm in. The question I wanted to ask you, uh, Dad, that I actually, I'm curious seemingly when and why that changed. And what I mean by that is like, I, I obviously watch all the old school videos. I watch the wins in the seventies when, mm -hmm. when right to left didn't exert. Yeah. Right to left. Right. Yeah. When it didn't really exist. Yeah. And I see a lot of your tournament wins, you know, playing the gutter firm speed. And mm -hmm. then I remember watching a show. I want to say maybe 1992 or three, where you actually made the show at Bradley bowl, Rob's home center yep. in Windsor. Yeah. And you lost to Dave Arnold and you were curving a purple urethane rhino pretty good. And then a couple of years later, it's 94, and now you're like in inside of 15. Yeah. Did in your eyes, like I always say that Walter Ray has always been one of the best, but but resin um, magnified Walter Ray. For for me, I feel like your migration in is also partially residue of the fact that the balls allowed for it. And is that did you always want to play in, but you just couldn't back then, and then the technology allowed it, so you it made it more comfortable for you yes, or? i always wanted to play in but it you were almost never allowed to my, my very first show i'm playing 15 i'm not uh you know all the way back and and you know when i was uh uh just out of the army and 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 the shot was very very tough the shot on the left was in and i and i made my first show that week you know i was the only lefty on the show i felt completely comfortable that I had a chance to, to, to play way in. But most of the time, I'm playing out. You're trying to stay away from the right-handers lay down point. That's that's the big thing. And that's what these are trying to do. They try, they got to get the ball through the front half of the lane without much of a problem. So what's changed in years is that as the, as the right-handers keep moving in, uh, then you're, no matter how deep you get, I mean, no, how, how far out you get, you're always putting the ball down in the right-handers lay down point. And if they're using a lot of surface,
they're burning up your laid down point, uh, not intentionally, but that's just where they want to play. You're watching um, Belmonte or two handers or people like that, you know, that are putting the ball down on, uh, let's say, 35, you know, and and, uh, and even if you're trying to lay the ball down on seven, eight, nine, you're they're still burning up your head area and you're starting to get early hook and you've got to figure out how to compensate that. So uh, what seems to have worked on the on on the left side is uh, you look at Buttruff, you know, throwing constantly urethane and, and you know ripping the cover off the ball, and and uh, he gets the ball through the front. The same with uh, um, oh god, I forgot his name. The other two hands yeah. that uh, yes, Jesper, part of it. Yeah, Jesper, uh, and and then you get somebody like Ryan Simonelli who who can do that with speed. All of them have, have different ways to be able to get the ball through the front and not have the right hand that said have moved way in affecting the game. It's a, it's, it's a changing game. And now with, with two handers, it's going to change completely from 10 years from now. I don't know, 75% of the field is going to be bowling two hands because of our scholarship leagues. All we have to do is look at that. Mm-hmm. Parker and I have a scholarship league and, and all of the kids that are starting, the 9, 10, 11-year-olds, they're all two-handers. You, you could see what's coming in the future. I don't know about the women, but but the men, it's going to really dominate when the time comes. Unless you're like a Chris Prather uh, that uh, can get so much on the ball anyway with just one hand and and cover the whole lane. That uh, the, the, uh, the real exceptions are Francois, you know, that uh, – absolutely amazing that he can compete uh with the two-handers and the and you know the electric wrists that are out there and with your basic classic game the way it used to be uh and it's tremendous talent to be able to do that now were you opposed to that style when you first saw belmonte bring it in i mean did you say like what what the hell is this guy doing uh no not really i was i was actually uh excited uh to watch uh he and i bowled a a doubles tournament in Las Vegas together, you know, when he first started coming to the U S and, and it was, it was ex- exciting to watch him bowl. And, and when they, when they bring up the point of, uh, of should, uh, should two handers be allowed? Well, uh, the mistake was probably made, uh, you know, uh, over a hundred years ago. And, and, you know, in 1895, when, when they set down the rules uh, uh, to, to have the first, ABC tournament in 1901. Uh, you couldn't, if you bowled right handed, you had to bowl right handed. If you bowl left handed, you had to bowl left handed the whole way. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess not to defend them. It's like, well, if you can't bowl right handed and uh, and you can't switch to left handed, you obviously can't bowl with two hands. Right. You would think that that would automatically apply, but it didn't. So uh, what are you going to do now? Somebody is bowling that way, which is legal for 25 years, 30 years, and you're going to say you can't do this anymore? Uh, You know, if it didn't work for Belmonte, then two-handers would have never come along. The reason everything changed is because uh, Jason did the tour, so everybody's following suit. And so now you've got um, Kyle Troop, Anthony Simonson, and a a bunch of others that that are are, are tremendous talents, and... uh, they're going to pretty much dominate the tour for quite a while. Did you think your son was crazy when he was taking his thumb out of the ball 20 years ago? Uh, you know, th- that's really hard to say, but, uh, you know, Mike, Mike Miller was a journeyman pro. He was mm-hmm. a good bowler, but he never, uh, you know, was like a superstar or anything. And he took his thumb out of the ball and he won a major and became the only brother, sister to win majors, him and his sister. And, uh, and I think, that had people trying it, you know, and, and then John was, was very good at it, is very good at it. I, the only thing is, does it really affect uh, your forearm and uh, is it hard to, you know, without creating injuries, you know, you're going to pull muscles and tendons and stuff, but it doesn't seem to bother him when he, when he does it, he, uh, uh, you know, he, he's just as accurate, that's for sure. And he throws more ball, uh, it'd be uh 
it would have been a lot better if he was right-handed actually with the game that he's got with no thumb, you know, yeah. uh, I think, um, I think uh, he would actually been a better bowler with no thumb with the amount of ball that he can throw. Uh, the, um, but you know that that's the way things go. What can you do? Right. <laughs> given the given the mechanics of, of you know, like the, you said, the wristers, right? They they have to unleash. That almost looks like it's more injury prone than not having your thumb in the ball because at least as you're cupped, you're still supported. Whereas when these guys uncoil, like almost like flicking a yo-yo, it looks like the way they yeah. with, a, with a 15 or 16 pound bowling ball. I, I'm surprised again, mechanically, hence being a smart guy like Dr. Ocho is, how are there not many more wrist injuries? Or maybe we just don't hear about them because we, we don't really hear the bowling news that much. But Well, that's, you, that, I think that has a lot to do with it, Doc. You know, it's uh, that uh, if, if somebody that's hardly ever making TV – has a wrist injury you don't you never hear about it you yeah. never hear about it you know you have if belmonte has a wrist injury or if kyle troop has a wrist injury you know if anthony simonson has a wrist injury you're going to know about it right away no doubt about it it's uh it's like all other sports you know mike trout gets a, a calf injury and the whole yeah, world yeah, knows about everybody it. knows it, it, the, yeah, my, minor somebody's, leaguers freaking do something minor like leaguers, it. nobody cares yeah, exactly that's but Dr. Rocho gets an injury, people are worried like anything. Oh, the whole world yeah, we, stops. We, oh, the whole world worried. stops. Yeah. Yeah, we, <laughs> I guess I get a sports center bulletin on, on my phone whenever something happens to Dr. Rocho. But uh, uh, we're going to wrap up this first segment. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we have a real, real treat for you guys. We're going to be doing a watch along of Johnny Sr.'s 300 game that he threw uh, on ABC. So we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, it's time to watch the 300 game. The seventh. Okay. 300 game. Uh, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Straight Up 5. Welcome back to the second segment of the show. It is time to get the perspective from the man who lived it. Uh, the 300 game that Johnny Sr. threw on ABC with his Forest Green Quantum Witch, sir. I still own one. I still have it. I showed it to your kid oh. uh, a few months ago. I still throw a Teen Little Pro. And my forest green quantum and a slot monster okay. that Johnny. Can hates. I say something before you start the video? Sure. Is that okay? Uh, one thing that has to be made because our our, uh, our player rep at that time was Ray Edwards uh, from Brunswick, mm -hmm. and we're bowling the practice session of that tournament. It's a major, you know, so it's it's uh, fifty six games. It's a lot of games, and we're bowling the practice session, and then Ray hands me the forest green quantum, you know, <laughs> with a with a nine inch hole back then from your grip around, you know, that really yeah. made it hook even more. And as I throw it in practice, I said, Ray, you know, where, where am I ever going to use this ball? I got so much hook, I can't control it. <laughs> and he said, just, just leave it in your bowling bag, make it part of your arsenal because you never know when it's going to work. And then on show day, when I made the show, I had been using a purple Rhino pro all week <laughs> and, uh, something happened on TV, uh, 10 minutes before airtime the oil carried down uh the lights affected it I'm, we're not really sure but everybody's ball started going straighter and straighter and straighter it couldn't even hit the head pin and ray says to me uh where is the forest screen quantum and i said it's uh it's in the locker room now we're on 27 and 8 and the locker room's behind 59 and 60 and ray runs down to the locker room grabs the bowling ball comes running back hands me the ball and that's when the tournament director says because i'm in the first match you have one shot on each lane, gentlemen, you know, and uh, I get to throw a ball on the left-hand lane, and Ray tells me, you know, move in, stand on about 40 with your feet, look at 20, let me watch it go down the lane. And he asked me to adjust a little bit on the right lane, and he said I would start there. And so the first game against Eric Forkel, that's where I'm playing and, uh, and making little adjustments, and I end up shooting 230 the first game while Eric bowled a 180. And and now we get into the second game with the three hundred. So it's uh it's important to to make everybody know that if Ray Edwards is not there, I bowl one ninety like everybody else. Okay, so it's and a, you should tell them what just happened with Ray after forty years of service. Oh well, Ray just retired. You know, yeah. after forty years with Brunswick, Ray just retired the other day. 
And you know, I wish him all ironic the for this freaking segment. Holy yeah, really. Shit, uh, who knew that? What we bring in straight up five. That's man. right. That's get right. this shit anywhere else. God dang it! <laughs> that, that's a fascinating <laughs> story. Dr. Ocho and Rad Rob bringing Johnny. Petrani that's right. As, uh, bringing the thunder. Uh, that's a, the life coach. That's a really cool story. Have you ever told that publicly before? I I told a few people. Yeah. Obviously, everybody at Brunswick knows it. <laughs> right. Um, and uh, but you know, more people should know it. Alan yeah. Alan Porton. Uh, now Ray, all these other years, you know, he, he worked uh, in R and D. He's the uh, he's the one with uh, uh, Bill Wasserberger. You know, Ray had, uh, you know, uh, Ray graduated with a major in in physics and a minor in chemistry. Wasserberger was the opposite: a major in chemistry, a minor in physics. They put the two of them together, and that's where all the formulas for the weight blocks and the covers come up with. And uh, now that we've uh, uh, you know, we own the seven companies. Ray is retired. Bill Wasserberger, unfortunately, passed away. So we have uh, Bill Olakowski and the folks from uh, from Ebonite that have, have come come into Muskegon and come together. So, and we also have uh, years of of Mo Pennell's blocks and 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 things that he's come up with, and uh, it, which I incidentally on Friday have to go to Mo's uh, memorial and. Uh, in pennsylvania you know brilliant guy yeah a little crazy but brilliant you know that about it. i mean I've all, yeah no it's true i mean i've always been a brunswick guy in my my entire you know bowling life as, mm-hmm. as far back as i remember so uh yeah like when that forest green quantum came out uh bradley bowl my home center i went into uh jr's pro shop and uh paid 200, <laughs> 205 dollars for that ball and uh, it yeah. com- completely changed my game so much so that I still love it and still use it today. I don't even care if it's twenty five years old or whatever. I still love that ball. <laughs> yeah, Bradley Bowl, one of my bowl favorite bowl? places to bowl. Bradley yeah, Bradley Bowl. Yeah, great. I I grew up there. My mom worked there, so you know I I loved Red. Unfortunately, Red's no longer with us, but uh, yeah, great guy, great center. I miss the days when when ABC used to come and pack the house and put up the bleachers and you know watch the TV show. I'd clean the telescores during the week. You know when they used to use the plastic. Uh, sheets to mm-hmm. keep score on and all that i was in the back spraying those and cleaning them off as a kid so lots of good memories back at uh at bradley ball so um let me cue up the video here okay i'm really looking forward to getting into this so uh let me pull it up oh that's not how i want to do it nope okay. hang on no nope. oh, ocho doesn't pay for bowling balls by the way <laughs> no you don't no you don't, don't. Ocho Ouch. never has, never will, doesn't have to, <laughs> even though I'm using outdated stuff. There too, we go. I don't mind. It's free. It's for Ocho. I'm going to turn the volume down a little bit so we can get your commentary here. But, uh, yeah, this is uh, this is a real treat. So let's hit play on this and let's go. Right now, player of the year. Okay, so uh, now we're going to watch the whole game here? Yes, we are. Yeah. I said, okay, so, you, Chris, well, this is pretty good because I, I'm bowling Walter Ray and, and, and now I'm, I'm lined up on the pair and the, uh, uh, you know, my first thought oh, is shit. that I can't make a mistake because yeah. Walter's not going to make a mistake. You know, he, that I, yep. he's the best in the world. And, uh, and so I'm going to, I'm going to have to bowl a, a really good game and, and numbers are in my head, uh, right, right from the beginning. And you know, Walter started with a strike. Okay, and and, look and at that so ball hook, uh, man. look at that hook. You know, I, yeah, I, I know where I'm playing, and and but I I just I handling like uh, you can't make any mistakes. Every shot's going to have to be perfect because Walter's going to bowl at least two fifty. And much it, like a golfer, you're already thinking the number even on the first. I'm, frame. I'm thinking the number that Walter's going to bowl and what right. I'm going to need. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's it's very rare that you think about that I think about who I'm bowling against and right. what I'm going to have to do, and uh, in in the, but in this situation, it's you know Walter was bowling so tremendous year after year after year uh, that um, you know you you know you need a big game and what happens right here is Walter Ray loses it at the bottom, just a, just just a, a shade so that. The ball hangs, yep. and he leaves the left-hander's uh, baby split. You, you always saw Walter get the ball over the line. If you watch the replay, you'll you'll notice that uh, the ball lays a little bit short, so it doesn't finish. Yep. And and Walter never did that. It just happened to happen on that particular shot. And so now he's shooting at the lefty baby split. 
and mm. and, he, and you know he, he gets to get the ball over far enough and i'm you know i'm amazed and i'm going oh my god this is this is incredible you know that uh now the best Walter can do is bowl two sixty eight. Right, your two sixties. Now you're thinking you got to bowl two fifty just to be. I'm in thinking that Walter's going to leave one ring in ten, which gives him two forty seven. So right now my number is 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 two forty eight. That's the number that I got in my head. Now right did, away. did that uh, make you feel? Uh, did that make you feel more at ease? Uh, you know, obviously when he left that open. Oh yeah, I, I just like I, I couldn't believe my luck. I said, right. "Wow!" Even if he strikes out, he can bowl two sixty eight. If he gets one rap, it's only two forty seven. Yeah. So I feel. And you were lined up too, as and you I'm said. lined up. I feel better already. Yeah. You now I'm at my favorite spot on the lane. I'm completely comfortable, and uh, you know things things are going really good about now in my head. And you're you're burying the shot too. So I mean, there, there's you know. Yeah, it was. Uh, you know, it, it just uh, the first game, the two thirty that I bowled, and the little adjustments that I was making really, really helped a lot. And, Ocho won ten grand on Louisville that day, by the way. Just, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and this one, uh, I'm pretty sure this is the one that I hit light. And uh, normally, you didn't get away with light hits there, but it, it hit in the right spot to blow the rack. So, okay, I'm going. I'm clean here, so I'm in the two twenties. Yep. This is this is good, and. Uh, and then they cut away to commercial. And yeah. is that that's a is, that's normally not like you said. You have to do it with Walter Ray. So yeah, that, can that get in your head a little bit? Because they always say I got to bowl twelve good shots. Is there twelve? It, well, it can. Shot? Yeah, and normally I never thought about who I was bowling against. And then right. he goes up and leaves that solid ten. And 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 when he leaves the solid ten, I it was wow. My my solid ten that I was looking for became. A, it came up early. I didn't know how many in a row he was going to throw before he would leave a solid 10. Yeah. And, and, uh, and he got it right away. And so now, you know, his max is 248. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm two strikes away from being in the 240s. It doesn't matter who you're bowling. Right. And it's, they, you know, mathematically, you can only bowl a certain score. You had mentioned that uh, the lanes got squirrely in practice. Is is this affecting him because he's throwing a little bit of almost a rollout towards the end? It well, looks yeah, at the that's it. Is that the uh, the lanes? You know, uh, the way that he was playing them originally, and and the lanes got tighter. You know, he was he was so moving. He's a walking bit. himself in a little bit, trying to stay uh, in the oil rather than it dying with uh, nothing at the end. It looks like Ocho knows this shit, man. Yeah, well, I mean, he's if you if you you know he he had that one ball that he laid short and uh, uh, that hit light, and the others were all strikes. You know, he was doing fine. I'm still assuming he's going to shoot the same score. Right. But now I'm in the two thirties, and uh, if I can stay clean, I'm in the two thirties, which means he's got to go off the sheet. And uh, so you, you start feeling confident now because uh, mathematics come into it. There's, uh, you know, he can only bowl what he can bowl, no matter how great he is. And then uh, that's what I, you know, that's what I'm thinking here. The last thing, by the way, that I'm thinking about right now is 300. Okay, right, right. right. You're thinking about advancing, yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking about I'm thinking about beating Walter. And now, okay, now I throw that sixth one, and I'm in the 240s, which means if I if I mark out, he's got to strike out. Right. That's were you uh were you always that cerebral when you bowled? Just putting you know, mathematics no, and breaking. Not it down? all the time. Okay. You know, most of the time it was uh against other opponents, it just sort of happened. And uh uh you know, it, like if you saw that shot right there that Walter through just about got the ring and ten out because the ball wasn't finishing really hard, you know, and, and um you know, it's still but you know, you're still looking at okay, he can bowl two forty eight. Yeah. And that, Are you thinking he's gonna make a ball change maybe just for something desperate at the No, I'm not even not even I'm not, not even not, thinking no. of that. So, right, not at yeah. all. I'm just thinking about, you know, what he's gonna do and and this was the miracle. Mm. He throws the ball through the nose. I said, Are you kidding? <laughs> yeah. Now he's at two twenty six and, and for me the game is over. You've seen that once in like ten years basically. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah really. <laughs> yeah, I was very, very surprised. Was and uh you know, and now, uh, you know, you know, can bowl is 226. All, all I got to do is bowl decent and then, right. you know, just stay clean. And, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very confident at this point about winning the game. I'm not even thinking about that anymore. And actually at the, at this point here, I'm, I'm not thinking about 300. I'm, I'm still thinking about winning. Yeah. 
And the first time that 300 comes into my head is when I get the eighth one, because uh, then, I, then I'm going to get up uh, for the ninth and tenth. And, uh, and, and, you know, when you get that far down the line, now you start thinking about it. These are so pure, though. Even that mixer was in such a – it was such a heavy hit, man. These are just blasting the freaking rack. It's the ball. That ball yeah, is amazing, you know? Yeah. No, the, it's not uh, the athlete. Yeah, tell, it's only the ball. Good no, 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 but I'm saying like – You're, you're, you're 300 <laughs> men shit because it's only the bowling ball. Thanks, Rob. Yeah. Great job. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, no, yeah but, uh, you know, it's just uh, – you know, everything was just going good. And – so uh, now all of a sudden I'm starting to think about it. And, and, and what had happened was the night before a uh, dinner with Larry Lickstein and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, that I had made the show and we're talking about the show and, and however the subject came up, it was, we started talking about, uh, you know, what first plays this and stuff. And I said, you know, I said, my kids are nine and three and, uh, you know, we're talking to the accountant about, uh, about college and 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 he's explaining that uh you know if if your son goes to uh a, he says let's just say it's a medium college with no scholarship he said that uh that it's going to cost uh uh 168,000 I might have it backwards 168,000 for one of your kids and 127,000 for the other and I'm looking at Lixton and I'm going you know three Three hundred thousand dollars. Where are you going to get the money to put, to put somebody through to college unless they're getting some kind of big scholarship? And like Lickstein says, well, you know, a good start would be if you bowl three hundred on the show tomorrow. <laughs> you know, and 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 we both laughed about that. And uh, and Larry was you know sitting there, uh, you know, right on the side as I, as I get up to bowl the tenth frame, and and right about now it hits me. I'm, I'm, I looked at Larry's face. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, he doesn't even know that I looked at him, but I sort of looked at his face as I got up in the tent and I said to myself, not to Larry, I said, you know, three shots to college. All of a sudden, things are going through my head like if we set up two accounts right now. Is any of it bowling at this 10, point? You're literally years from playing. Now, you know, 10, 15 years from now, the, the money should be enough to put them through college. And uh, that one was lucky. Because when you hit there in this house, you always left a flat seven. Yeah. And the ball cut the seven pin out, which uh, that that really helped me a lot saying, you know, uh, that that hit wasn't supposed to strike and it did. Th things are, uh, you know, it doesn't get much better than this. I, Rob, I, uh, can you pause the show real quick? Can you pause? Absolutely. The yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. No. So so let's let's we need a quick recap here. So he's got the front nine, or he's got the front nine. Front ten and, now, front yeah. 10, well, yeah. But, but before that, you're telling a story that you're now thinking and you're calculating interest about how much the, <laughs> yeah, the three hundred would be instead of man, I got to hit my shot. So eight frames prior. He's like, I got to be dialed in. Walter's going to shoot 250. I got to shoot 260. Now you're like, what am I going to do that? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That was crazy. Wow, yeah. wow, he's telling us this oh, story. Yeah. Now everybody knows how much of a whack I am. Okay. <laughs> well, if, if they play the post freaking interview, everybody's yeah. going to know anyway. Yeah. Uh, so, Go ahead, Rob. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. So, so before we get into it, like, what do you, th I mean, are you nervous at this point? Like, how was your composure? I, I was. I was okay. I wasn't, and and I'll explain why. It, it, in uh, in you know, 17 years prior to that, in, in in Garden City, I was bowling Mark Roth, and uh, you know, you're prepared for pressure. You always are. And 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 Andy Verapop was my coach, and I've got uh, the first 11 against Mark. And 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 uh, if I can strike on the last shot at that time, it was ten thousand dollars and and a new car if you shot 300. And when I got up at the last shot, I was very, very nervous. I wasn't expecting the amount of pressure that was there. And uh, uh, and with Andy sitting directly behind me, I, I he threw the ball through the nose. I made a terrible shot, got an eight count. And I felt, well, I lost 10 grand. I lost the car. And and my, my coach watched me choke. You know, I felt really bad about that. But what happened here was that, as I was getting up for this shot about all the other things that are going through my head, one of them was, if you throw this strike, 
you know, be ready for the amount of pressure that's going to come. Yeah, I, you know, it was, uh, yeah, I knew what it was going to feel like this time, which was a tremendous help. And the other help was that I'm playing way in instead of way out like I was in Long Island. Right. So there's no threat of making a terrible shot and throwing it in the gutter or, or anything like that. And I'm in my favorite spot of the lane, you know, just uh, it felt like just clear the thumb and it's going to get to the pocket and then you leave it up to God, whether you strike or not. Right. All right, here we go. Now this one, uh, this could have been a solid eight. That, that had been did a great job, you know. <laughs> <laughs> this shot almost gave mom a heart attack. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's the kicker. That's right. Almost gave yeah. him a heart attack, too. <laughs> Down on your knees after every shot now. I mean, I'm you're really feeling it. Yeah, Elmer, I, yeah. Elmer Fudd thing where the money bags are floating away if that head, that eight pin stays up. <laughs> yeah. He was. This was, uh, <laughs> the, uh, I guess, the, the lucky thing about me back then was uh, the, the more pressure that I would be under, the more I, my knee would drop. Uh, I, I would get lower to the ground, which – helps your game yeah you know and uh so i sat really low on this shot and trusted it and dude and uh and that's why larry comes running over because i know that he's <laughs> thinking about the uh uh he's thinking about the the dinner the the night before yeah and then uh it, it it was it was just great. I, Larry was really hysterical. He was. And, there, and yeah. Ray Edwards comes into the picture here. I, I'm pretty sure he does. Yeah, a big curly haired guy. Yeah, there he is, hugging and, you right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ray was there, and and uh, also uh, you know uh, Branham and I and, and Curtis Odom. Uh, while Curtis Odom was doing all the replay, you know, we uh, it just was uh, one of those weeks where the guys that I was hanging out with a lot that week. Uh, happened to be there for the show i know randy peterson felt very bad about not being there for this and uh, uh it was just uh one of those special moments and then uh the good thing that happened was um uh, uh daryl ducat the owner of the center uh after i got the 11th one he called somebody over it to call the guy in the back and said if uh if Johnny throws his 12th strike, take the 10 pins out. And, uh, mm. and, and at, right after the strike, he took him out and, and, uh, and he, uh, he gave me, uh, he gave me the 10 pins after the show was over. And yeah, John will show you one of them. Uh, yeah. what had happened was I, I, I said, you know, uh, there's, uh, there's people that, uh, deserve this, uh, That's you know, awesome. put the 10 pins at, trophies made and 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 obviously uh uh three of them were going to go to to my wife my daughter and my son and the other seven were to uh people that made the 300 happen you know ray edwards and and uh you know daryl ducat and and uh john laspina uh because of of where i grew up bowling was able to practice uh and actually, I, I, Schenkel had, had had passed away right after that, and and uh, 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 Burton, you know, who called the three hundred game, and, and and in any event, seven people, seven other people got the pins that that uh, we had made into a trophy, and so John still got his, which uh, that's important to me. I think, yeah. thankfully, he still has it. And um, a banging shirt. And both of the kids graduated college. You know, that's you that's go, the right? other thing. Yeah. That's the craziest part. Yeah. I can't and, believe my sister graduated. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's where we're going because again, we still didn't replay the post interview where uh Johnny P Sr. is beyond he can't catch his breath. He's trying yeah. and, and this is a pro. He's been in front of the camera so many times. He's talking about building sheds and getting hammers from True <laughs> Value Hardware. And yeah. I, this was the greatest post game freaking interview I ever saw. It, it was beautiful. And it was yes, genuine. Yeah. Oh, that's big picture. Of course it was. Yeah. Kids college and paid for. I'm gonna build a shed with a hammer and a saw from True to put the quantum in, I uh, wanted to build a case so I could put the quantum in it. That's what. Did you keep using a ball? Company? That's funny. Like, you know, whenever somebody wins the Daytona 500, they usually take the car and put it in their museum down there for a year and, and they can't touch yeah. the car again. But did you think about retiring that ball or did you keep on using it? Oh, no, it got retired. And, and what had happened was uh, 
I never told them where that ball is, by the way. Yeah. Uh, no, no. Okay. So, so what happened <laughs> uh, after that was over is the uh, uh, I the, one of the first phone calls I get is from George Randazzo, who's the uh, at that time the president of the Italian American Hall of Fame in Chicago. And he tells me, John, I want that ball, you know. And I said, well, I said, uh, first of all, uh, you know, if if uh, if my wife uh, wants me to keep the ball in the house, that's where it's going to stay. And if she says no, then it, the Bowling Hall of Fame would get it. And after that, I said, uh, if, if those two are not going to take it, uh, then you can have it. And he goes, okay, I'm third. That's that's. And I said, yeah, that's that's fine. You're third. So when I got home, I asked Pat, I said, uh, you know, what do you think? And she said, ball doesn't belong in the house just for us to look at. The, belong, the ball lo belongs to the bowling public. And so she says, you know, you know, let it go to the Hall of Fame. And I'm not sure what the curator of the Bowling Hall of Fame was thinking at that time, but he really wasn't interested in the bowling ball and then oh. which sort of surprised me but you know a few years later when parker bowled 300 in the stadium in their tournament the masters they weren't interested in his either they're building their turn i i mm. still don't know why and yeah. you, this was but, the seventh ever on tv on we're tv saying, yeah. right and like this so, is so this is beyond historic it's so rare and that, yeah, man. Oh, man. I don't get yeah. it. I don't know. So I called George Randazzo and say, you got you. Know, you can have the ball. <laughs> and he sets up a date for me to come into Chicago and he puts together a luncheon and he has the press, radio and TV paper come in and they do a whole presentation and turning the ball over to him covered all over Chicago. And, and the ball is now in the Italian American Hall of Fame. That's where it is. And that's how it ended up there. So uh, at least we always know where it is. You know, that's, right. that's a good thing. He had to be surprised as shit to see the ball, right? I mean, he's thinking he's third. He's never going to get it. But yeah. yeah, yeah, he was so excited. <laughs> and I did that. It was a great thing, you know, because that hall has a lot of special things in there. Like when you would walk, you would see uh, Michael and Mario Andretti's cars from the Indy 500. They had uh, 11 of Matt Biondi's uh, uh, medals from the Olympics. They have Jake Lamada's robes. They got uh, Mar Marciano's gloves and shoes. They got those kind of items, and and so the bowling ball to them was a really big thing. And oh, then, you know who's a, sorry, Dad. You know who's in yeah. that Hall of Fame? Bruno Sammartino. Bruno Sammartino. Well, I went I in was, with Bruno. Yeah, that's, I was told. Listen, I'm the Petraglia life coach. You think I don't know that? I was yeah. told that years ago because of uh, my longstanding in every community that I'm in. Yeah. But yes, I did know that. I wanted to call it the Guinea Hall of Fame, but oh. I, you know, I think it's yeah. just, for some reason yeah. they didn't like Perfect. that. You know, it, the one thing, it, yeah, I went into the Hall of Fame with, with Bruno San Martino when I got inducted. And Bruno's about six feet, 230. Okay. And he, he was also into, to, you know, lifting uh, weights for records. And think about this. He is standing press. He pressed three, uh, he pressed 320 pounds over his head, 32 times wow. that's it just just and think he, about and that, that wasn't that wasn't weight. that wasn't the like the jerk where you jump down no no this is standing there and doing a press yeah and coming was, back down and doing a press chested freaking yeah. oh, his, over yeah, 30 was, times yeah his chest was huge. <laughs> that's one of his records yeah, yeah just amazing uh <laughs> how strong he was were you a wrestling fan when you were younger back then yeah i i was sort of in it and 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 john was really into it yeah. you know he had yeah that one year for Christmas, he was so into it that his mother made a ring so he can have his rubber wrestles, <laughs> wrestling figures. He had a, an he arena to put him in. He loved uh, Hulk Hogan. <laughs> Just it was, uh, fun there years. was that story about Randy Peterson that uh, now I want to hear. I want to hear the senior okay. version because I think it was touched on. Oh, right? We're going to get into that. We're going to get actually. That, oh, we are. We're going to say that for okay. a third. We'll say that for a third segment. Uh, I just want to wrap up this one with a couple of questions, uh, senior. Um, what did Ray say to you, or what did you say to him when everything was all over and, and everything had calmed down? Uh, did you, obviously, you thanked him for the tip, right, for the, for using that ball, but what was oh, your yeah. conversation like with him after that? Uh, well, you know, I, I just, uh, you know, everything that I'm telling telling you, you know, I just, this would have never happened without you. And, 
I, you know, I trying to figure out what to give him, you know, give him 10% of what I wanted <laughs> or, or, you know, or at least some kind of an item that he would always, always remember. And, and, and Ray in, in typical Ray fashion, when I said, you know, if you weren't there, if you weren't doing what you did and, and, and Ray's answer was, I, 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 I drilled the ball. I ran to the locker room to get the ball and give it back to you on the lanes. I helped you line up. He goes, but you threw the ball. He goes, that's the key. You got to He says, you know, I might've given you the bowling ball, but you're the one that did, you know, everything else. And, and don't ever forget that. That's cool. Which is the way that Ray would answer. And uh, just before you cut away, you know, I know a lot of people know this story now, but one of the great things was that uh, as we're coming off the air, uh, the lady at the desk says line four is for you. It's the white house. And then, uh, and, and I said, no, it isn't. And she said, yes, it is. And I said, no, look, I says, Bill Clinton isn't sitting in the white house watching the bowling show. And before we're hardly off the air calling up, I said, it's just a prank call. And so I said, just, you know, hang up on them. And she said, you are probably right. She goes, but just in case you're not right, I am not hanging up on the president of the United <laughs> States. So I said, okay, I'll take a call. I'll, I'll handle it. So I got on the phone. I said, hi, this is John. And on the other end, the guy on the other end of the phone says, hi, John, my name is Joe Cirillo and I own the White House Tavern in Chicago. And you don't know me from Adam, but the whole bar is going nuts. You know, and I was, uh, one of the greatest things that ever happened. A hell of a lot better than getting a call from Bill Clinton. I know that. That's terrific. <laughs> That's fantastic. It's a rock star <laughs> moment right yeah, there. That is the perfect yeah. way to end the segment. So uh, <laughs> when we come back, we're going to get in some stories uh, with, with JP Sr. and Jr. And Ocho's got one that he wants to tell, too. So, no, oh, I don't. No, okay. no <laughs> don't. Come on, Ocho. Uh, when we uh, come back, uh, it'll be story time. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Straight Up 5. All right, welcome back to Straight Up 5 with our very, very special guest, Johnny Petraglia Sr. We're going to get into some straight shooting here. We're going to talk about some things uh, maybe maybe some people haven't heard before uh, and maybe actual the real version of some stories that happen other than what Ocho says. Here comes some straight shooting. It's time for straight shooting. Johnny Jr. and the boys sit around, tell stories, and hopefully teach everyone some life lessons. Nothing is off limits. They let it all hang out. Get ready for some straight shooting. All right, so Ocho, you've told a story about how you met how you met Senior uh, in the bar. Didn't know him from Adam. Uh, re- refresh us, uh, Ocho. This, this isn't the point because I'm their life coach. So don't, <laughs> don't try and downplay this. Like these people learned so much from me. It's okay. The point was I wasn't much of a bowler. Now I am because I learned things fast. But we had gotten our asses kicked one night by this gentleman named. John, because that's all you see on the bowling score is actually it just said J-O-H because I think only the first three freaking letters were up there. He knew that I was one of the best doctors around. And afterwards, he asked me a question about his thumb. So I know it's his right thumb. And I knew he was a lefty because he just beat the shit out of us literally that evening. This J-O-H guy. And he's asking me, his thumb's all swelled up. And I'm like, and, you know, me being the bowler for three years at this point, I'm like, well, hey, maybe you smashed it between two bowling balls without knowing, you know, because most of you bowlers are idiots, I guess. And I don't know shit about shit. And he's like, no, it definitely wasn't that. And and now I'm looking, I'm like, oh, shit, it really is. I remember saying, like, did you get bit by a spider or something? Because it's swelling. But then again, it's not really red or anything. He's like, I have no clue. I'm like, all right, tell you what. You just give it a few days and ice it every 20 on, 40 off. And if in, in it was a Wednesday night, cleaners league, that's the part I remember, of course. I remember everything. And I said, if it's bugging you, then, you know, call me Friday. We'll take an x-ray. We'll see what's going on. Now we stumble in, 
stroll into the pub area <laughs> and i happen to say you know if you quit shoving your thumb up your ass so much maybe it won't swell that much and i chuckled and he chuckled and the bar falls deathly silent <laughs> as if i just shot kennedy <laughs> and i'm like ha, 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 what what's going on and there and i got freaking glick saying we don't have to give full names right we'll nah, whatever you want to do it doesn't matter and he goes yeah. you know who that is and i was like I, it's John. John. <laughs> oh, H, man. Of course I know who that is. Like, yeah. He's like, no, but do you know who? And he, they're just grilling me. And I'm like, tells me about the Triple Crown. And I'm like, this dude's six feet tall. He don't race horses. Fuck you. There's no way this guy won the Triple Crown. And he's like, there's a bowling Triple Crown. And I was like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Let, give me my freaking Blackberry and leave me alone. I don't want this shit anymore. I, he crushed us. We took, we lost, what was it, out of 21 or something those nights? I'm like, we lost 21 fucking points. Let me freaking just pain my misery. I made fun of the guy. It was great. And he laughed. And no one else did. Like, what a freaking shitty joke and then I come to find out that it's this gentleman here and there was there was a conclusion a few months later where like i really did feel bad because i didn't fucking know i'm dr ocho i got my own shit going on and i we, we'd always just find we'd be sitting next to each other just goofing off not doing anything much and you know just talking to stephanie the bartender and talking to the idiots and whatnot and <laughs> I said, I said, hey, by the way, I really do want to apologize. I honestly had no idea who you were. And he's like, no, I whatever, man. It was a funny joke. We're good. Like, he's like, yeah. you know, we're always next to each other. And I was like, yeah, I just figured you're a glutton for punishment. He goes, no, when you, whenever somebody comes by to talk to me about bowling, you make fun of them so bad that they walk away and they don't bother me about bowling. And I know you're never going to bother me about bowling. So therefore, this is kind of my space that I can just hang out. I was like, well, shit, if I'm doing you the favor, I guess I'm okay with it. So I was like, that's, it's not intentional. I'm just, it's midnight. I don't want to freaking be bothered. We're just having our freaking belts at the end of bowling. And it turned out to be a, uh, then I became their life coach. So then all the fun stuff happened. Is that pretty much uh, how you remember it, Johnny? Uh, yeah, he, uh, he, he, he was also very loud. You know, he would, he would really get oh, upset yeah. when somebody no. threw a lucky strike. He start yelling, "Oh my God!" and a few other <laughs> expletives, and and you could hear him for thirty lanes, and just was, <laughs> it was sort of uh, scary bowling on the same team. Same this team is this him. is to prepare people for when they're under them pressure moments too. Because I can't even that, remember how I got on his team. I don't understand how that happened. <laughs> you, I think you wanted you want a raffle, is what it was. Yeah, I think there I was like this big raffle about who wanted to yeah. bowl with Doctor Ocho, and I think you won, and Tino and Glick yeah. happened to be the winners. And I was even saying I was the for some reason the second high average by a lot on that team, <laughs> <laughs> which should not have been. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was fun. That's what bowling is. It's supposed to be fun. So, so of course it was. Yes. So mm -hmm. the the funniest part to wrap up this story is. What your girlfriend said to you, uh, well, maybe a month or two later, when you're watching uh, PBA uh, on ABC. Oh, my ex from years ago. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, when yeah, yeah. When, when I still then when I find out who he is, I start. There's classic bowling on ESPN every you know noon every. So I got the TiVo going and everything, and and I there was like a bunch of like a, literally a marathon of the Johnny Petraglia opens. And it says it right there, the Johnny Petraglia Open. And I was watching these guys. And there was junior in the background, senior in the background. And she's like, you really had no fucking clue who he was? Like, come on. And I was like, I just didn't bowl. I know who he is now. I'll be nicer. I promise. That's an amazing story. I always love, I always love when Ocho tells that story. There's another story that I actually want to get Johnny's perspective from, but it, it, it involves uh, some chips getting smashed. Do you, do you remember that story, Johnny? About chips getting smashed? Yeah. Do you need Ocho to set up? It was a long time ago. All right, Ocho, set it up for him. We'll see if he remembers. Oh, yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah he just, when he crushed 
when he crushed all the potato chips on the bar with his fist. Yeah, I just, uh, I just can't remember why he did it. That's uh, so he, he's an because, asshole. That's probably why. Well, but, but that, no, so so Kenny had these little wise potato chips yeah. and said, "Oh, they're for Johnny." He bowled a three hundred. So I smashed him and said, "Well, now there's three hundred little fucking potato chips." Yeah. Now again, <laughs> JP Senior, the pro, no sells it. Opens up the bag and drinks them. Literally drinks the chips like there's no tomorrow. Uh, and then he got me, And then he got me back uh, when Steph put out the nacho platter uh, yeah, the last night right. of the year. Yeah. Yeah. So what did you what did you do to him get him back there at the last last night of the year? You just do the same thing, you know, just crush his nachos. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> he came in with the Polish hammer this way. He yeah, was doing yeah. the puts the hammer out of nowhere. I'm just like, oh, I'm just gonna oh. have a little chips and sauce, and here comes a black. This guy knows karate, by the way. So it ain't yeah. like he's coming in with nothing. Oh. He's coming in with hammer fists and freaking freaking CR yeah. eminences and whatnot. He knew what he was that's, doing when he was smashing chips. That's that's right. That's true. I was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, I was starting to get professional on the chips. <laughs> can, can we make an assumption that Dr. Ocho has destroyed bowling at this point? Can yeah, pretty just, much. Uh, at least we agree can. to that. Yeah. Like, yeah. Just just for the sake of this show, let's just make sure that we know what the, the true villain is <laughs> for the <laughs> okay. I mean, you are wearing a lucha mask, so there's that. Yeah. Uh, they, they don't know who I am. That's the beauty part. How many months later did that happen, Ocho? Do you remember? From what? From chip the first chip. time, from from the the one chip to the other. Oh, uh, the the one chips was I think probably it was cold. So Mar and the the one was the last night of the year because the the bartender put out the platter. So that's yeah. end of May, I guess. So I guess uh, he carried the grudge for a good three months. Three <laughs> months later, and he called it back. I'm like how great as is a that? Vietnam vet. Well, no, tactical. you just you got to plan in advance. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> 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 and you never saw it coming, did you? <laughs> we went from watching the one of the best 300s ever thrown on television to this, Rob. Is this yeah. the host that you wanted to be? Yes, really? absolutely. Yeah. This is this is what I really want to get into is, is the, the behind the scenes stuff. Um, so uh, your son told us about a story uh, involving you and Earl Anthony. Uh, Junior, you want to set that one up? Yeah, I, I try. I try and tell this story. We, we've had uh, shows in the past where we talk about like what makes the greats great, and I had referenced the story about a time that I don't know if you were keeping score or whatever was going on. Earl was not only the only lefty that got a check a certain week, but he yeah. qualified like twenty fourth, made it to the ladder, and then lost the second match. And then you had gone into the locker room to tell him what an amazing, what a honor it was to watch what he did that week because you knew how tough they were and he you know was basically so in his own brain at that moment that he was a little nasty in his response uh, as if yeah, to say yeah. like, what, had, what had happened actually he didn't he didn't he didn't make the show but what he did was he made the finals top 24 and no other lefty got within 50 pins of a check and we were staying at gary mage's house both of us at, and uh and after it was over, uh, after the tournament was over, uh, Earl finished, I don't know, maybe in the middle of the pack, 12th, 13th, somewhere around there, which was tremendous. Yeah, nobody, nobody could even get close to a check. And we were having a late barbecue in the backyard at, at Gary's house. And, and uh, I was congratulating Earl on what a tremendous week he had. And uh, he said, this week sucked. And I said, Earl. I said, you, you made match play. You, you, you made the finals where nobody on the left got even a smell of a check. I know how tough they were out there on the left side, and you, you bowled great. And he actually grabbed my arm and said, listen to me. He goes, second is a bad week, period. And, and he said, second's a bad week, Earl? I said, and he goes, yeah. I said, well, are you ever happy? He goes, if I win, I'm satisfied. If I'm second, I'm unhappy. You know, and uh, that was his... Uh, competitive nature and uh uh obviously that's what what made him so great but also at the same time that's what you know i'm a lot happier person than he was you know <laughs> right. i think right. you know because uh because winning was such a uh, uh it was so know, hard to win basically that uh you know nothing could beat that the 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 memories of winning really outweigh the memories of losing by a by a mile right so yeah, he and yourself were, you know, my bowling heroes growing up. So uh, uh, I, I, I'm a lefty myself. 
So I always gravitated to oh. uh, to, to left-handed bowlers. Uh, but I also loved guys like, you know, uh, Amaletto, uh, Mark Roth, um, uh, Walter Ray, and, you know, uh, Voss, Albee. Uh, you know, I, 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 those were my, my formative years growing up as bowlers, mm-hmm. watching the PBA and ABC for all those years, listening to Bo and Chris call the games like nobody else. I mean, they were really the best team that you'll ever see. Um, how special was it when they wanted to name – you know, tournaments after you, like the Johnny Petragli Open. I mean, it had to be a big honor for you. Oh, tremendous. That was uh, very, very special. And, and uh, well, I guess, I, I don't know, I guess, uh, did John tell you the story about when we were talking about wrestling? Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah. About when he was a kid, you know? Yeah. Uh, I don't know, seven, eight years old, maybe. Uh, and and so have you told this story on the on your podcast, John? Yeah, we, yeah, we, we want to hear about that. Randy? I'm talking about the, Randy and uh, Palumbi, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. I think uh, I've definitely told that story, and it was it was actually sure the whole pilot. bowling world knows that story. Yeah, yeah. but okay. it was our pilot episode that really wasn't part of this show. Okay. So if you right. want to recash it, then we're good. Yeah, yeah. Go yeah. ahead. As, as far no, but as far as the uh, naming the tournament after me, it, it's a, it's a wonderful honor. And the, when we would have the celebrity pro ams, uh, uh, all the pros that we were able to get from other sports, you know. Uh, John Bull and Jerome Bettis, you know, that was, right. uh, yeah. that was, you know, that, bowler, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Jerome's a terrific bowler. Really, you know, really he good. did great. And, but the, uh, I, 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 I guess it, it, it needs a little bit of mentioning when, uh, in the story where Ron Palumbi and Randy Peterson were staying at the house and the, and the three of them were wrestling in John's room. And, uh, uh, about that time, you know, one of them picked them up and, and you know, body slammed them on the bed, and they broke the bed. You know, the bed collapsed, and and here they are trying to put the bed back together. <laughs> and my wife Pat, uh, she had called everybody down to dinner, and, and they're still trying to put the bed together. And and you know, come on now, come come downstairs, and and so now they're all coming down the stairs, and and as they were getting into uh, by the kitchen, there uh, they they were essentially lined up. And, and and Pat says, you know, when I call you to the first time i don't want to have to call you twice and then she looked at randy and she says and you're older you're supposed to know better <laughs> so, <that's fun. laughs> so what it actually wow. happened is and he says i'm sorry pat you know what I'm so what it actually happened wow. is he, he did a macho man elbow under your kid and that's how the that's how the <laughs> yeah, they, that's how the bed got broken. yeah he drops the elbow the bed splits the, yeah, randy dropped, looked me in the, the eye this close and he goes <laughs> Are you okay? Are you okay? I'm laughing my ass off. I go, I'm, yeah. I'm perfect. He yeah. runs out of the room like he has diarrhea. Yeah. And he's halfway to the stairs yelling, Pat, Palumbi broke your dad, your son's bed. So oh, he sold the it. other guy out? Oh, yeah. Like fast. <laughs> fast. It was awesome. That's a great Knowing story. already he'd be in trouble since you, you if you miss dinner call once, right. like you're already yeah. in trouble. Like, I just, yeah, he's, he's just... He's a glutton for punishment then at that point. So what did your yeah. wife say when uh, she found out that, you know, Randy broke the bed? Who paid for the bed? Uh, no, if we did. It was okay. You know, I, <laughs> if we're going to if we're gonna put my wife in here, I'll, I'll tell one quick story about her. Sure. Okay. Oh, yeah. Mom's stories are the best, by the way, in case. <laughs> no, this is just a little one. Good that we, when story. we first went on tour, uh, you know, when, uh, it was our first year and, and, and we had this band and, we're leaving LA on our way to Vegas, so we're going across the Mojave Desert. And and Pat always had a cute way of of, uh, of telling a, a joke. And she's looking out the window, looking out the window. Uh, after about a hundred miles, she looks at me and she says, "It's a very disappointing desert, John." And I said, "Well, what did you expect to see?" She goes, "I don't know, sand dunes and occasional camel." You know, that was that was priceless. Something I'll never forget. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great story. <laughs> oh, Doctor Ocho liked that one. He, he did yeah, because I, the, the, it's it's a little bit of the absurdity of it, which just makes the joke. That's what's great. About it. So okay. uh, we mentioned the movie uh, Greedy off air. Uh-huh. Uh, how did you get involved in that in that project originally? Uh, you know, the movie. Uh, you know, Brunswick got contracted to. Uh, to supply all the bowling balls, the lanes, and and teaching Michael J. Fox how to bowl. And so uh, it started with uh, that 
the, the difficulty that became what with, with Michael was Michael was a terrific, very competitive guy, very, very down to earth, normal person. And he wanted to become a pretty good bowler. The director said, forget about Michael becoming a good bowler. Just make him look like a, a good bowler. So he, he was more interested in make sure his form looks like a bowler. I don't care where the ball goes. We're going to use split screens. And, but Michael said, but now I want to bowl better, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and he worked very, very hard at it. And, uh, you know, when you look back, uh, you know, it was about two months in New Jersey and then the rest of the time in California when they were filming the movie. And uh, there was uh, one particular time where uh, Michael had to throw a strike. And uh, when he throws the strike, he has to uh, go like this and make believe that he had a gun down there. And when all the pins go down, go. Yeah. And. Uh, the lanes were, were really getting tough and and the crowd is supposed to be cheering and and screaming on every shot and and I, I guess he threw about 30 shots and and never struck and and now it's like one o'clock in the morning and he threw a shot and he and he finally did strike because this wasn't going to be a split screen they wanted to shoot it from the back and then they would turn it and shoot it from the front and he got so excited look that uh he didn't do what he was supposed to do. Oh. And then, oh my you know, God. he just he just started clapping his hands and he was so happy. And then the director says, you know, no, nice shot, Michael, but that's not what we want. We want you to stand there like you had a gun and go like this. And uh, so he goes, well, we'll have to cut and, and do it again tomorrow morning. And he said, no, we're not leaving. I don't care how long it takes. I'm not going to get up and start this all over again. Wow. I'll buy you a Mercedes if I have to, but <laughs> we're going to get this done tonight. And in the next five shots, he did. He threw a strike and, and held his composure, stayed at the foul line, and and blew like he was firing a gun. It's uh, Meanwhile, yeah. when you watch the movie, the yeah. shot that he actually points the gun is yeah. not shot from the back. Right. Yeah. It's, it's a light hit two pin. Yeah. They, a, they, they change, role. they change so they that. They could have spliced you know. it in anyway. Right. Right. right, right. Anyway. They could I, like, splice it in, you know, any way they wanted. And, uh, wow. Uh, there was a, there was a few things like that that they should have, uh, they should have done that, uh, but they're not bowlers. They're, that's yeah. Hollywood, you know. Right. You said when, when they set up the temporary lanes in the hotel in LA, mm -hmm. yeah. that, that was like Michael's best day ever on the lanes. And, in yeah. that segment of the movie, you actually see him throw what Michael J. Fox strikes look like. Yeah, that was where they went to the, the Ambassador Hotel had closed. And this was supposed to look like, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Kirk Douglas's uh, basement where he's got his pair of lanes in his private house. So they took the lobby and they built walls uh, around it. And then and Brunswick put in a pair of lanes uh, to make it look that way. And then. They put in French doors to the right and, and and had giant floodlights to make it look like that was outside where the jacuzzi was. And and so that it looked like somebody's house. It was this, uh, what they do with it. And Michael really was sharp that day. You know, he, he made some good shots that day. And, and all the strikes that were thrown were thrown by him. He did a good job. We, we got to peel back the curtain a little bit more here because you're saying New Jersey and L.A. And as as a Petraglia life coach, I know that you drive everywhere. Yeah. So you, that's that's a it's not like you just get in a car and, you know, go to freaking Long Island for the weekend from Jersey for a two and a half hour drive. You're you're driving across the country and you were still on tour around this point, too. Yeah. Yeah, well, but I had I had some time because uh, they were done with that location, and the and the next location that was going to be coming up was going to start in about a week. So you know, I had time to drive cross country. And didn't they? Why wouldn't they bus you then? If they if you're in a freaking program, they should freaking have a freaking. Because I had a, I had to pick up the tour. We were head out west anyway. It, oh, it so you're you're fun. literally going back to work? Is literally yeah, oh, going wow. back to work? Yeah. So and uh, you know I. Everything that all, all nothing but good memories about the movie. They they, uh, you know that it was a lot of fun seeing the make believe world. I guess would be the best way to put it. The uh, the the thing. One of the coolest things they did was uh, uh, Olivia Dabo was the, the the woman in the movie that uh, is supposed to be uh, Kirk Douglas's 
girlfriend, I guess you could say. And, it's and nerd. so there's a scene where Michael's supposed to be in, in his basement practicing and there's a jacuzzi there. And, um, uh, so, uh, that what they do is they don't, they, the stars aren't out there getting all the locations set up and everything. Uh, Olivia Dabo has a double dressed in the same bikini, blonde hair, built like her. And, and she gets in the jacuzzi and, and gets out of the jacuzzi and gets on the steps. And they have somebody, Michael, doing the same thing until everything is set up the way that they want it. And then they, they call the stars out of their trailer. And so now Olivia Dabo gets in the, in the jacuzzi. And, and her and Michael are going to get into an argument. That's how this works out. And she gets out of the jacuzzi and they start doing the scene and somebody blows their lines or the lighting isn't right or whatever. And they say, cut, take two. And she doesn't have to get back into the jacuzzi. They're happy with that part of it, of the way that she got out and she hit her marks. She doesn't have to do that again, but they have to do the scene where they're talking again. And so after three or four takes, I noticed that there's these two women with these little bottles standing on either side of them just off camera. And then uh, before they start the next shot, he says, you know, hold it. And and he says, two women run in and they start spraying Olivia Dabo with these water bottles because she supposedly just got out of the jacuzzi and now she's drying up and, and they, they, so they have to spray them and then they jump back off camera. And then he says action. And when you watch the movie, the, the scene comes out perfect, you know, and, uh, it's, uh, you could swear that they're outside. You could swear that, that, uh, that, you know, she just stepped out of that jacuzzi, started talking and, and she wasn't drying off. I mean, it's, uh, Hollywood's a different place. Yeah. You, what you see in uh, something not really see it. It really is fake world there. Wow, and the yeah. detail has to be. Oh my God, that's a great point. And they uh, and they and the uh, the people that I think should get a lot more credit than they do are the grips, because uh, if the director wants something, you have to do it instantaneously. Like uh, and, and that one scene, uh, he wants a light in a spot. And the grips immediately built a uh, like an eight foot high frame, so that they can hook a light up to it at the top of it. And they, they got it done in five minutes. You know, yeah. they're coming there with hammers, saws, banging it together, sticking up there. Where's the light? How do you want it set up? Uh, just uh, you know, uh, it probably got them from Ace True Value Hardware too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> since it was 1994. Right. They really that's know their craft. You know, that's uh, <laughs> that is pretty wild. So they're they're building yeah. little friggin' hutches for people. Uh, yeah, they they could do anything that 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 whatever the director wanted, they're able to do it instantaneously. They know what's coming, and uh, and would get it done. That's so cool. So that's cool that you got to see you know the behind the scenes stuff. Yeah, the behind the scenes stuff was great to watch. Yeah. Now, if I remember right, Junior was uh, did Michael throw a teal Rhino Pro? It's been a long time since I watched the movie. Is that what he was yeah, throwing? Yeah, he was throwing a Rhino Pro. It was like yeah. twelve pounds, right, Dad? Yeah, teal Rhino Pro, twelve pound conventional grip, because he had never done it before. His wrist was really starting to get sore, yeah. and then you know I had a uh, and 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 patch up his fingers and thumb all the time because he's so used to not bowling, right? And uh, so he would he would start to rip, and there, and at that time. Uh, 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 you know, uh, the, the, the protective skin wasn't, wasn't made yet. It was, if you, if you were getting a blister or something, it, it was, it was only new skin. So I'd have to patch him all the time. And, and, uh, and his wrist was really starting to hurt him. So he got through it. He did good. And when you, when you chalk up the years of when it happened, uh, you also realize that that was probably the beginning of his, um, uh, not Parkinson's or Parkinson's. something. Is that weird? Yeah, 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 and and that he he was he was probably having a couple of problems with that, and 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 got through it. You know, without you knowing, he did he did really well. That that's really cool. Uh, Real good person. Junior told a great story about just how cool it was to be sitting there, and you know, uh, Michael J. Fox is at my house, and we're we're playing Nintendo together. Uh, oh yeah, they were. Yeah, they became friends. You yeah. know, they were have they were having a good old time. You know. Just uh, taking uh, Carla to the bowling. Remember Carla taking her to the bowling alley wearing that Carla. shirt? Yeah, that's right. That's right. You took Carla to the lane. Yeah, they were seventh heaven. 
Yeah. <laughs> it was some pretty, and what's ironic is this, the, the, the movie produ the production of the movie, Michael was at your, at the Johnny Petraglia open, the, yeah. which was the week after the televised the week after the show. Yeah. So you want to, you want to talk about a, a warm, a warm welcome just to add to everything else that was that week home. Michael was yeah. there too for that. He was there too. Yeah, it was it, it, it couldn't have been more perfect. It was just like all of the all of the cards fell right into yeah, place. Yeah, the universe the, just lined up for that. They lined shit, up man, just for that. Really? The stars aligned. You know, yeah. they got together. That's My only issue was I never got to meet Olivia Diabo, and mm. that's what I really. Wanted. <laughs> she was hot. I think I'd still be with her if she met me. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Junior is uh, is such a wealth of knowledge when it comes to the sport of bowling, and I, I can obviously see where he gets it from. He gets it from you, Johnny. Uh, but you know, the kid's like an encyclopedia when it comes to bowling. He literally remembered yeah. what segment uh, was uh, one of one of the Johnny Tragley opens where you told kind of your your life story in a quick little video. You talked about Vietnam and your dad and all that. But Johnny, for our listeners, I'm going to put you on the spot. When yeah. did that? What show was that? And what part of the show did it take place? 1990, Johnny Petraglia Open. Bob oh, Benoit, right. Bob Benoit bowls 275 uh, against uh, Amleto's 244. Uh, no, it wasn't Amleto. It was Norm Duke throwing a Cobra. 275, 244. And they cut away to the commercial break. And before the semifinal match against Charlie Tapp, they played that segment. They played that video. Yeah, where uh, we had filmed the video. Mm -hmm. you get, uh, and you got quite emotional during that video too. Yeah, I still I get emotional all the time about that, uh, about about the vets and stuff, you yeah. know, and uh, yeah, what everybody's gone through. And yeah, Jamie was what? Jamie was born that September. Well, so, oh, this is the ninety-one JP Open. So yeah, yeah there's like uh, she was six or seven months old, maybe. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. It's amazing what that kid remembers. It's just it's almost like Ocho with Steelers scores. That's how that's how Johnny yeah. Jr. is with, with opening bowling. week in ninety one. The Steelers beat the Chargers twenty six to twenty. So somebody oh, fact check yeah. it. I don't care. I got it right. <laughs> Neil O'Donnell at one of four for ninety yards with a ninety yard Neil touchdown O'Donnell. pass. Yeah. Because Bubby got freaking had a concussion and he threw a ninety yard touchdown pass to Dwight Stone on a screen. Not like I remember. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, Johnny Senior, it's always uh, good to have you here. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you. We'll have to get you back on here sometime. To, I know you have a lot more stories uh, that you could tell, but I really do appreciate you coming on here. Like I said, this has been like a bucket list of thing of mine to uh, to be able to talk to you. Growing up, watching you uh, over the years. I mean, I just you know it might be kind of corny, but thank you for entertaining me uh, for so many years. You know, on TV, I was you know just a big bowling mark. So uh, you know, thanks for all the years of entertainment. Well, Rob, thank you for having me. And, uh, you know, uh, Ocho, it's good uh, seeing you again. And, <laughs> 2620. I can't read that. It's 26, yeah. I'm just fact checking. 1991. Yeah. And, uh, oh, okay. Thanks, Ocho. I'm, 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 I'm appreciative you know. to be everyone's life coach here. And I'm glad yeah. you guys use the principles that I applied to you. And I hope everybody else does. And we all learn from each other. And that's the beauty yep. of this thing. And now, uh, go ahead. You finish your thing. But as you know, right. I just, I love, I love being humble. All right. Yeah, I'll just finish with my son. I love you, man. Take care. Wow. <laughs> that's it. And he gets up and runs away. He ran away. I mean, that, 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 that's what he does. No, he, he always does that. Ocho. I to. It's like it's my thing. Ocho, where, oh, where can I we find you? On? I'm glad you were here tonight. Yeah. Thanks. Ocho, where can we find you on Twitter? Deep. Okay. Uh, I, I, where can you find? Actually, you know what I screwed up is uh, an eighty-nine, uh, an eighty-nine yard pass from uh, Neil O'Donnell. I kind of screwed oh, up by a yard. So. Oh my God! Off, you made a mistake. I was yeah. off by a yard, but um, yeah. he went yeah, one of four for eighty-nine angle. yards. Where, where, where am I on Twitter, Rob? Help me out here, buddy. At thank the, you for doing this. At the Dro Cho, you can find Johnny Junior on Facebook. Just look up Johnny Petraglia. See, he stole his dad's name. He didn't put the Junior on it because you know his dad doesn't want to get on Facebook. All right. Uh, yeah. Was was there a reason why you don't want to get on Facebook? I mean, your millions of fans would like to interact with you. Uh, there's a lot of reasons which I really don't want to go into. That's, That's fair. Uh, That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> I, I ruin it for him. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah exactly yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, guys, hope you appreciate this episode with the one and only Johnny Petraglia Sr. and Jr. and, you know, the Ocho. Uh, we'll be back for next week for another edition of Straight Up 5.
We'll, we'll, we'll see you next week. Thank you, guys. Good night. night. Thanks for listening to Straight Up 5. If you would like to send your questions into Johnny Jr., send us an email at straightup5 at gmail.com. That's straight up F I V E at gmail.com. We'll see you next time for another edition of Straight Up 5 right here on the Rad Rob Radio Network.